Nehemiah 13. Lots of valuable lessons in this last book of the Old Testament. You say, wait a minute. There's a lot after this. Well, last chronologically, this would, this would have been written uh, after the division of the kingdom, after the captivity of the northern kingdom by Assyria, after the captivity of the southern kingdom by Babylon, and then after the return. And so this is actually chronicling the return. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at signs of spiritual growth evidenced in the people of Jerusalem. Now, if you've read through Nehemiah, I was, I was thinking on this and just how to phrase what we're looking at. Would you say that the people of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time were spiritual most of the time, spiritual some of the time, or rarely spiritually minded? What would you say? Sometimes. I, I, the, the reason why I phrase it that way is because the longer I look at this, the more I see that their experience kind of mirrors our experience. If I were to ask you over the last 10 years of your life, have you been spiritually minded most of the time, some of the time, or rarely spiritual? And, and if you're honest, you'd probably say, well, I've kind of done this, right? Because sometimes we, we have some times when we feel real close to the Lord. Sometimes we have times when we, you know, we, we go a week and we, we don't really think about the things of the Lord. And then we have, have times of, of pretty intense spiritual growth followed by kind of some backsliding perhaps. Our experience is not, uh, it's not on the trajectory that we would like it to be, is it? We're not always getting closer to God. Now that's not God's fault. Whose fault is it that I'm not always getting close to the Lord? It's mine. Why? Because the Bible says, God says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. So, so if I'm not getting close to the Lord, the problem is, is that I'm not drawing close to the Lord. And so that's exactly what's going on here. But it seems that... Israel, during the time before Ezra got there, and then before certainly the time that Nehemiah got there, they were in kind of one of the, one of the troughs of their spiritual experience. They were not close to the Lord. They were not walking uh, in, the, in the path that God would have them to. They were not following the law of God. And part of the reason for that may have been that they didn't read it. They, they, they weren't in God's word. They, they weren't spending time. And so one of the hallmarks of their spiritual growth has been an attention to God's word. They're spending time again in God's word. Last week, we saw a few more signs. They, they paid attention to God's house. You remember, there were some people who were, who were kind of trying to exercise squatter's rights in the temple itself. They had moved in. They made an apartment in one of the side rooms of the temple. That's not allowed. It was the room where they kept sacrifices. But since they weren't using it for sacrifices, somebody had moved in there and set up house. They had a willingness to make difficult choices. Remember, there were the mixed multitude, is how they're referred to here. They were the Moabites and the Ammonites that had kind of blended in to Israelite society. And, and Nehemiah and Ezra and the other spiritual leaders of that day said, no, we have to divide on this because God said that Moabites and Ammonites are not allowed into the temple. They're not allowed to do this. And, and because they weren't in God's word, some of those things had kind of fallen by the wayside. There is a continual and repeated emphasis placed on the reading and understanding of God's word. Now, this would have been before the days of books like we have. Their books would have looked more like a scroll and a whole lot harder to come by, a whole lot more expensive. And so not everybody had a copy of the law. They didn't have the entire Old Testament or the entire Bible as we have. They'd have had the law of Moses. They'd have had, they'd have had portions of the Old Testament, likely some of the, the Psalms, some of the Proverbs would have been part of their their scriptures, some of the minor prophets, but not everybody had it. 
So it wasn't that they could wake up in the morning and pull out their own personal copy of God's word and read it. In their day, they would go to a central location and they would have God's word read to them. And it wasn't just that it was read to them, but that it was, it was, it was time taken that the understanding could be given. As they're reading through, right now, I'm reading through the book of Job in my devotions. I'm going through Job. How many of you have read through the book of Job before? It can be rough to understand, can it? Because as you're going through, you realize it's true that the people said what they said, but what they said isn't true. You know what? I, did you follow me through that? Okay. Eliphaz and, and all of these people, Job's friends, they said things, but they're not true. They, they were speaking error, but the Bible accurately records the error that they spoke. And so as you're reading through, if you don't read for understanding, if, if I'm just reading so that I can get to the end of the chapter so that I can finish, I'm likely to, to mess something up. I'm likely to misunderstand, and misunderstanding leads to misapplication. And the people in the time of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were taking time to get actual understanding. We dealt with some of these last week, but in Nehemiah 13, this morning, we'll take a look again, and we, we introduced this briefly before we ran out of time last week. They had a passion for obedience. It started at the top. It started with Nehemiah, and it kind of trickled down to the rest of them. Take a look at verse 15. You'll probably remember as we read this. Nehemiah 13, 15. In those days saw I and Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. The Sabbath being... Saturday, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath day unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Real quick, anything wrong with people bringing in wares to Jerusalem to sell? In, in and of, no, certainly not. There's nothing wrong with, with the program. The problem is that it's happening on the Sabbath day. Okay, that's the big issue. Look at verse 17. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So notice who he, who he takes issue with first. He doesn't go and, and get in the face of the merchants. Who does, he, who does he speak sternly to? The nobles, the leaders, the Jews. He's not, he's not getting in the face of the merchants. He's getting in the face of, of his people. Why? Because they should know better. You should know better than to do this. We've been reading, he could have said. We've been reading, you know what God says about the Sabbath. You know, he says, in the Ten Commandments, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and here you are bringing people in to sell goods and wares. You know better when he says that they're profaning the Sabbath, that we have that which is holy and that which is profane, that which is set apart and that which is common. Their problem is they're treating the Sabbath day like any other day. It's a day to buy, to sell, to get gain, to do whatever you need to do. <clears throat> Verse 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates, and there, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and the sellers of all kinds were lodged, uh, all kinds of ware were lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. So this went on for two weeks. He blocks it off. He says, look, if you're not going to do right by choice, then you'll do right by constraint. And he locked the doors. But the, the, the buyers and sellers, the merchants, were they necessarily all Jews? No. no, they were positively not all Jews. We have that there were men of Tyre and Sidon. 
Is there anything wrong with them selling on the Sabbath day? Now, I know I'm splitting hairs here and probably walking on dangerous territory. Is there anything wrong with the Gentiles, those who don't follow Jehovah, selling things on the Sabbath day? Not necessarily, because they didn't have any idea what they were doing, right? They're not, to them, Saturday, just like any other day, they don't. Their worship day, when they worship their gods, might have been on Thursday. We don't know. Okay? So they're coming in, and they're trying to just keep up the status quo. We're going to go into Jerusalem. We're going to sell our stuff. Because why? Because when we sell our stuff, we get money. We like money. The much hasn't changed over all the years that has gone on. But Nehemiah blocks the gates. He says, you can't sell. You can't come in. You can't sell on Sundays. And they, so they camp right outside. Do you figure there would have been any, any Jews, any of the Hebrews living in Jerusalem, who would have woken up on Saturday morning and realized that they didn't have enough food for lunch? And, well, the merchants are right outside, so we can slip through this door, and I can go outside. I can buy what I need, and I can come back in. No harm, no foul. You figure that might have happened. Likely that happened. Why? Because they were the same type of people that we are. Okay? And Nehemiah got wind of this. Take a look at verse 21. Then I testified against them, and I said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I'll lay hands on you. <laughs> again, when we talk about the laying on of hands, it usually goes along with healing. Okay? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about laying hands on them and uh, grabbing them by the scruff of the neck here. So he's not happy about this. I'll lay hands on you, verse 21. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, that they should keep, uh, come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. And then he prays, Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. So Nehemiah's appeal. Yes? Would, would you compare the, the, our church houses today somewhat? Very, very roughly, they went to the temple to worship. We come to the church to worship. I mean, there's most of what happened in the temple doesn't happen here. Nobody brought sheep this morning, I hope. Uh, you know, it, it's very, very different. But similarly, it's a, it's a special place set aside for the worship of, of God, similar to, to this. But n not, not a whole lot of parallels in that. Again, we have chairs in here. We have no altar in here where we make sacrifices. And so much changed after the death of Christ that it, a lot of the parallels break down. But similar in some, in some settings. We, we, we should. Um, we can't say the church is what we worship. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to set up a flea market in the parking lot this morning would, would not be a good idea. Um, it, to, to what you're saying, if, if you burned down this building, the church still exists. Why? The, the church is us. We're the church. This is, where we, this is where we sit. This is where we meet. But the church is is. You and I and those who have, have called on the name of the Lord to save us. So we are the church. The building is, is, is there anything special about church? Yeah, there's, it, it's a building that is set aside for the worship of, of God. Would it be offensive if we, if we said, well, you know, we, uh, we don't use the church on Thursday evening, so we're going to pull the pews up and we're going to let, we're going to let the, you know, we're going to have a, allow a dance party to come in and they can just, you know, they can do whatever. Kind of, yeah, it sounds just, no, it's not. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 it would be a problem. That, that should grate on us. Look, there are some things you don't do in church, right? And, and that's okay. And, and it kind of runs parallel to the, to the temple, but a whole lot 
And someday maybe we'll take a look and we'll, we'll kind of run the track and we'll look at the, the parallels of the church and the parallels of the temple or the tabernacle. There's a lot there. But in this case, Nehemiah is confronting the people with some truths. He's saying, look, you know better than to do what you're doing. How you're acting is unacceptable. You're, you're buying and selling on the Sabbath. The, the, the merchants from Tyre, they don't know better, but you do. And the reason I know you do is because you've heard the word of God preach. You've heard Ezra while he stands there on the street corner and reads God's word. And it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And here you are making it profane. It's a big deal. And he actually says, he says, it's, it's why we actually ended up in Persia in the first place. As a matter of fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21, this is the reason for their captivity. The reason, one of the reasons, and a very important reason for their captivity, was that they had not kept the Sabbath. It says, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years, or seventy years. The people had stopped observing the Sabbath. And so God said, well then, I'll make you observe the Sabbath. You'll go into captivity. And the Sabbaths that you should have acknowledged in the land will be acknowledged without you in the land. And so the children of Judah, in this case, were taken out of the land for 70 years. And so the Sabbaths were fulfilled, but God takes it seriously. The Sabbaths are kind of a big deal to the Lord. And then Nehemiah notices that the merchants come in. They're trying to park outside the city and sell their wares on the Sabbath anyway. He warns them to leave, threatens physical violence, which again... Not the best means of, of doing it today. But we deal with this on a daily basis. This, this same principle, because that's what we're looking for, we don't deal with people selling in our parking lot. Okay, That's not something that we deal with. We also don't worship on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath day and the, the, the laws regarding the Sabbath day are, are not applicable in, in our case. We don't observe the Sabbath the way that they observe the Sabbath. We don't even observe days the way they did. When did the Sabbath start? Friday evening. And when did it end? Saturday evening. So everything was different. It was a different time, different day. Everything about it was different. But in, in drawing application for our lives, the children of Israel knew better. You ever do a sin? You ever commit a sin where you knew better? Yeah, once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This morning, right? right. We, we do that all the time, don't we? How many of you have ever heard or even used the phrase, well, so-and-so fell into sin? You ever, you ever use that? They fell into sin? It's, I know what we mean. I've used it. I'll, I'll probably use it again. Is it really accurate that so-and-so fell into sin? Or was it more like they walked in with both eyes open? That's how we do it a lot of times. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And yet how often do we go against God's word and we know exactly what we're doing. We know on the front side, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. And as we go into it, we know I shouldn't do this. And we do it anyway. And then we end up yeah, after we've committed the sin, we have the guilt. We have all of the, the baggage that goes along with it, and we go to the Lord, hopefully, and we, we genuinely confess. We repent of our sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we go before God, and that's a wonderful thing. And then we wake up the next day, and what do we do? A lot of times we do it all over again, don't we? We live in this, this sick cycle. We talked about it in the book of Judges, where they have sin, and then they have, they have judgment, and then they pray for deliverance, and God sends a deliverer, they have deliverance, and then they have sin, and then they, have, and they just keep going through this cycle over and over and over again. And it would be easy for us to say, oh, those, those poor backward Israelites, but we do the same thing. We do exactly the same thing. We have we, we would write it off sometimes. At, well, that's the that's the sin that so easily besets me. That sounds spiritual, doesn't it? When we phrase it that way, is it? Do you have a sin that so easily besets you? Yeah, <laughs> we all do. 
A handful of them, probably. We have sins. My, my body likes to sin. How about yours? Yeah. yeah. I Occasionally I ask it, is sin fun? And we immediately think, I'm in church, so we should shake our head this way. But no, the reason, the reason we sin is because it's fun, right? There's pleasure in sin for a... It's a short-lived pleasure, but there is pleasure. That's why we do it. If every time you sin, you had horrific pain instantly, you wouldn't do it quite so much. But the trouble is, is that we have instant gratification and then delayed consequences after sin, usually. We have the sins that so easily beset us. We have the ones that we've been fighting with for years, perhaps. You say, well, well I've lived most of my life struggling with this particular sin. Maybe we've even experienced judgment or punishment for them in the past, but we still fall for them every single time, it seems. And, and the sin that so easily besets me, you may look at and you say, I don't struggle with that at all. And I may look at the sin that so easily besets you and say, that's not even a temptation. That, that's, that's how Satan works. They're, they're kind of custom made. The thing that would get you may not get me. And, and so we have our individual uh, issues that we struggle with. Romans chapter 13 verse 11 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul, speaking to a group of believers, says, hey, you know better. You know better. Just like Nehemiah in the Old Testament says to the Jews, hey, you know better. Paul says to the New Testament believers and to us through the, through the Holy Spirit, hey, you know better. And we do. He says, it's not time for this. The day is late. You think we're living in the last days? Paul thought so 2,000 years ago. If he was living in the last days, then we're living in the last of the last days. And he says, hey, you need to behave the way that Christians should behave. He says, don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What does it mean to make provision for the flesh? means that I'm setting myself up for it, right? That means I, I'm walking down that aisle. I'm, I'm reading that book. I'm, I'm watching that channel. I'm calling that person, and I know it's trouble. I know it's going to lead to, to sin. I know the path that I'm headed down when I do it, but I make provision for the flesh. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This, let us lay aside every weight. Here's how we lay aside our, our weights, okay? Weights being sins that so, so easily beset us, okay? Here's how we lay it aside, ready? I'm going to illustrate for you. Here's how we do it. Am I laying it aside? No. Walking away from it, but you know what I can do? Okay. I can pick it up. That's not what this means. If you go and look in the, in the original language, the idea is to cast forth. Now, I'm not going to illustrate, but uh, it would be to, to fling it from you, to get it way far out so that you can't pick it up, so that it's not a temptation. I'm not going to make provision for the flesh. I'm going to get it away. On my shelf in my office, I have a decommissioned hand grenade. My wife gave it to me. No, she didn't really. <laughs> it wasn't decommissioned, but she, <laughs> but she, she gave. I, I have this, this decommissioned hand grenade, and, and I've used it before to illustrate this. If I were to, to pull the pin on a hand grenade, and I release the spoon on the side, and I hand it to Sid, and I say, Sid, there you go. How do you figure he'd act? You figure he would... Sit it next to him, pat it once or twice, and go on, 
throw it right back to you. Yeah, he'd throw it right back to you. It'd go out a window. If it didn't have a door, he'd make one. Why? Because this will kill me. The, the application is simple. From, from Nehemiah, don't make provision for the flesh. He, got, he was willing to get physical with them. He was willing to, he said, look, you do this again and I'll be down here and I'll move your junk for you. Get it out of here on the Sabbath. Don't do this. Don't set us up because we've already experienced the judgment of God for this. Get your wares and your stuff out of here. You can come back on Sunday. You'll be here. You can be here Sunday through Friday, but you can't be here on Saturday. You can't be here on the Sabbath. And, and he's not making provision for the flesh, and yet we do. We need to be careful. When you have those sins that so easily beset you, don't set yourself up for them. It's you know better. Everybody knows better. Anybody on the outside looking in would say, they shouldn't do this because if they do this, they'll end up doing this. But we're in the middle of it. We're blinded to it. And the trouble is we really want to do what we shouldn't do. We have a bent to that. So don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Nehemiah realized the nature of men when he told the merchants, don't even get close. You don't, you don't set up right outside. We have sinful habits that, if we're not careful, we'll develop in our lives. The, the way to beat a habit, you say, well, I want a diet. And so I bought lots of Oreos. So that I can resist temptation. Because I feel that it's good for my will. It's good, it's good practice for me to say no. <laughs> yeah. And three sleeves into Oreos. You're sitting there thinking, I'm going to start my diet tomorrow again. Right? That's how it works. Because why? Because we make provision. If you're going to be on a diet, what should you do with the junk? Put it in the garage. Right? No. You get rid of it. You can have that one last time with you and all the stacks of Oreos before you die. Okay? But you, you get rid of it, you get away from it. And when it comes to sin, we do the same thing. Could that be interpreted if it says don't, don't make provision for the flesh, not to even gather any food? Or... I'm just asking if that could be interpreted that way to some people. No, it, the, the provision, because in Romans, it's not, the context is not that of food. The context is that, is speaking of, it's not provision, uh, food, clothing, it's not that, it's not essential provision. It's, it's making allowances, making, me giving myself some slack. Don't give yourself spiritual slack, because you've heard the phrase, if you give somebody enough rope, they'll hang themselves. You give yourself enough spiritual slack, and you'll mess up, okay? The appropriate amount of, of sin that you can have in your life and still be in control is zero, okay? Because sin is something that Jesus died for, and we should take it very, very seriously. It's somewhere along the line, and I don't know where, but it was mentioned that they would go out on Friday because they couldn't walk so far on the, on the Sabbath, they'd go out and lay food. Yeah. Or have to take it. They, they could walk to it, yeah, that happened a little bit. That wouldn't have happened during this time. That happened in Jesus' time they were doing that. But that, that developed a little bit later. But yeah, they, they got kind of nitpicky about the law. But I'll tell you what, better to be too strict, and I'm not advocating to be a Pharisee, but, but wouldn't you rather uh, get to heaven and find out that you were too serious about avoiding sin than get to heaven having lived in sin your whole life because you gave yourself slack? Because you said, I can handle it. You, you can't handle it. It doesn't work that way. Now, this was not an exhaustive study of Nehemiah. We could go on for sake of time and because we're going we're gonna to move on in our, in our next series, uh, we'll, we'll close up Nehemiah. I would encourage you, take some time, go and read the whole thing. There are parts of it you'd say, well, that's just a list of names. Read the names, read through Nehemiah. Get the, get the information. It'll be a blessing to you. But let's bow for a word of prayer this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the privilege that we have 
of being your children, having your word. Lord, I pray that this morning, as we've seen the importance of a lesson from Nehemiah, to not make provision for the flesh, don't, to not allow uh, ourselves to have spiritual slack and think that we can handle it, but to know that we can, to know that we'll fall if given the opportunity, but that we would depend on you. Lord, we know that, that those who walk in the Spirit, you say, will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I pray that we would do that, that we would walk in the Spirit. I pray that you'd uh, bless our time together now as we prepare for the main service. In Jesus' name, amen.